Welcome back to Hashtag Sisters in Law with Barb McQuaid, Jill Winebanks, and me, Joyce Vance. Kim is off this week, but she'll be back next week, and we already miss her, so have fun, but come back soon, sis. A lot of you have seen us in our amazing Hashtag Sisters in Law merch, and you've been showing us pictures of yourselves wearing it on social media. We are really glad that you're as crazy about it as we are. And if you haven't already, you still have time. Go get yourself a Hashtag Sisters in Law t-shirt or a hoodie. There are other great choices, too. I really love my Hashtag Sisters in Law water bottle. So go to politicon.com slash merch and make sure you tweet us a picture of yourself or tag us on Instagram. We love seeing you. Today we'll be discussing the involuntary manslaughter case against the Michigan school shooter's parents. We'll take on recent developments in the January 6th committee's investigation, including Trump's mishandling of presidential papers, even to the extent of flushing them down White House toilets that ended up clogged. You can't make this stuff up. And finally, we'll discuss the federal hate crimes prosecution of three men who were previously convicted in state court in Georgia of murdering Ahmaud Arbery while he was out jogging. As always, we look forward to answering your questions at the end of the show, but before we get started, I have sort of a difficult, sensitive problem that I wanted some input from my sisters on, and here's the situation. You know, we're a couple years into the pandemic. A lot of people have terrible COVID fatigue. We're we're nearing what everyone hopes is the end of this wave of Omicron, but we are not out of the woods. Um, And so I had a difficult situation today where I went to a surprisingly large gathering of people. And when I walked into the church where it was being held, I was one of two people in there who was wearing a mask. I even had a woman, and, and this is people that I know and that I love and that I'm that I hate that I haven't seen for the last two years. But I even had a woman who wanted to stand next to me to have her picture made, which I sort of did. I was a little bit nervous. Um, You know, my mom is is in a a medically assisted living setting, and I'm very protective of her and of our our kid who's high risk. And, And the woman who was taking the picture said to me, take your mask off. And I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. And I felt rude, and I felt like I was the Debbie Downer. Everybody else was masked. A- am I wrong No, here? 100% no. Um, I've seen some of that too, Joyce. I think, I, I'm sure, you know, to some extent, there's, there's regional uh, differences. Um, and perhaps it is because I work in a university setting where we are mandatory vax and mandatory mask. Everybody is masked all the time. And yet, despite the fact that everybody is required to be documented vaccinated, there have been a lot of breakthrough cases. And so it is not, you know, a complete 100 percent immunity from uh, becoming infected to where uh, to, to have the uh, immunization. And so wearing a mask is just, you know, what you do to avoid the spread in your community, even if, you know, you yourself uh are, are willing to take the risk, you know, think about what you're doing to members of the community. I hear people say this line, I'm so over COVID and I'm so over masking. Well, you know what? COVID's not over to you. Um, it is looking for people to infect. And for those who let down their guard, I fear is what keeps this extending and extending and extending because we haven't been able to beat it back. I read an article recently about the 1918 flu that had four waves. And the reason it had so many waves is even though people initially did wear masks, they got tired of it uh, and they stopped too soon. And so, uh, you know, uh, Joyce, our our former boss, Eric Holder, used to always say, run through the tape. It's not good enough if you do the job 85% of the way and then you run out of gas and you stop. You got to run through the tape. And I think with COVID, um, you know, um, we should be modeling good behavior by wearing our masks and running through the tape until this virus is eradicated. How about you, Jill? How are things in Chicago? I am completely with you in terms of I am continuing to wear a mask no matter what anyone else does. But the governor has just announced lifting of a mask mandate. Uh, I'm concerned about that because I do think it's probably too soon that the science is not with removing masks just yet. And first of all, it's Chicago, it's freezing. The mask is good outdoor protection, not yeah, just right. indoors. It's like an it extra really scarf does something. keep you warm. It's better than a scarf. I really love it. But yeah, it makes me feel a lot safer. And Joyce, you weren't rude. That person was rude to ask you to do that. And I wouldn't do it. Um, I know they're lifting the mandates in a lot of places, and I am doing a live event in California in 
another week. Um, and the rule is they have to be vaccinated to come in, and they've reduced the uh, crowd in the room to half the capacity of the room so that they can allow for social distancing. Um, but there is food, so people will take their masks off. But they're all vaccinated. As Barbara said, the vaccine will keep you from being really sick or dying. It won't keep you from being ill. And I don't have time to be ill. We're too busy. Everyone is too busy. So I don't mind wearing the mask. And I have found some that are now comfortable, that are NIOSH-approved K95s, KN95s. Um, and I'm going to keep on wearing them. And I think I would encourage everyone else to stand up to the bullies who say, take it off. And just you choose to wear them. It will protect you. And for you, Joyce, who has to protect your mom and your child, you have to stay safe. And that means you have to keep that mask on and keep changing it so that anybody who breathes on you without a mask, you get rid of it. Well, I'm glad to hear y'all's views. I think that there's, you know, it's always good to do a little bit of a reality check because I do worry a little bit that I've become reclusive during COVID and, and maybe a little bit overly careful. But it seemed smart to me to keep a mask on and I'm glad y'all feel the same way. On November 30th last year, Ethan Crumbly a 15-year-old shot and killed four at his high school in Oxford, Michigan, and he injured seven, including a teacher and six students. He used the gun his father bought for him just days earlier as an early Christmas present, and then his mother took him to a gun range to use that gun just after it was purchased. He has been charged as an adult, despite his age, with 24 counts of first-degree murder, assault with intent to murder, and a unique terrorism law, which is because he intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population. His parents have been charged with manslaughter, and this week there was a preliminary hearing to determine if there is enough evidence to hold them for trial on those charges. There was a day of dramatic testimony, and the hearing has now been continued until February 24th. So I think it's a good time to look at the case against the parents so far and whether this case could open an avenue to reducing school shootings where children kill children and teachers. Let me start with you, Barb, because you, of course, were the U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of Michigan and, of course, teach uh, at the university law school there. So you can tell us about what manslaughter under Michigan law is and also talk about what the facts that have been presented in this first day of the preliminary hearing to establish a basis for the charge against Ethan Crumbly's parents. Well, as you say, Jill, both parents have been charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter. So one count for each of the four victims. And the penalty for involuntary manslaughter is up to 15 years in prison because there are four that could be stacked to 15 times four for 60 years. But uh, you know, a judge would, would impose that only upon conviction and at this point, they're certainly presumed innocent. But involuntary manslaughter is causing a death without intent to kill. So it's an accidental or an unintentional killing. So maybe if you punch someone in a bar fight and accidentally kill them, or if you're driving recklessly and you kill someone, you might be charged with involuntary manslaughter. Um, but as we teach students in law school, all laws uh, that are crimes require both a mens rea, that's sort of the, the guilty mind, and an actus reus, which is the bad act. And you need both of those things to uh, have a, a crime. And then in the case of any sort of homicide, you also need causation. Your act has to cause the death. So the tricky part for uh, manslaughter cases is mens rea. That's the intent. And in an involuntary manslaughter case, the intent that must be proved is recklessness. That is being aware of a risk and then ignoring it. And here the question will be whether the parents knew that their son had access to a gun, that he was having fantasies about killing people, that he had been researching ammunition in class the day before. Uh, there are text messages that seem to support uh, an argument that they did. So all of those things could point to knowledge of a risk that they ignored. And then as for the actus reus part uh, in an involuntary manslaughter, that is the act that causes death. And this case is unique because it involves parents. And that makes it one of the rare instances where someone can be held accountable for their omissions, 
what they didn't do, what they failed to do. Ordinarily, a person must engage in an affirmative act that causes the death, like the punch in the bar fight or the reckless driving. But for certain relationships, like the relationship between a parent and a child, their their acts or their omissions can be considered for the purpose of criminal liability here. So, uh, you know, ignoring the warning signs, not taking him out of school, providing him with the gun, you know, all of those things could make the case for involuntary manslaughter here. And Joyce, did you want to add anything to the information about the charges? And uh, you can do so, but I also want to make sure you talk about the terrific piece you wrote in the New York Times about holding parents accountable for this and possibly other uh, school shootings, not these parents, but other parents. Um, our listeners can find a link to your piece in our show notes. But why don't you talk about what you wrote? Well, I think Professor McQuaid gives us a great layout of involuntary manslaughter, which in some ways it's really difficult to understand this notion of recklessness, negligence, carelessness when you apply it to a death. And how do you figure out who caused that death in some pretty attenuated circumstances? So it's important to note the limiting principle here that we don't hold parents accountable for everything that their children do. The reason that this case gets charged as an involuntary manslaughter is because the facts are so extreme. The Crumbleys bought the gun. They taught their kid to use the gun. They failed to store it securely. I think even that alone would not have been enough, but what happens is you match that up with the fact that the school let them know that their kid was actively fantasizing about killing people, that there were drawings. And what do the Crumbleys do? Do they say to the school, oh my God, our kid has access to a gun, we just got him one? They don't say that. They don't disclose anything. They insist that the child stay in school. They don't even suggest a check of his backpack to make sure he doesn't have the gun. And it's that unique set of facts that makes it possible to charge them here. You know, increasingly, we live in a very permissive legal climate for gun ownership. I think the Supreme Court will make that a little bit easier for folks to have guns in public after uh, this year's term is done. I hope not, but I suspect that they will. Jill, I see the grimace on your face as I say that. Um, but it's it's hard to believe that they're not going to make it a little bit easier. So I think seeing a prosecution in a case like this one, hopefully in addition to holding these parents accountable for their omissions, as Barb properly explains, but I think hopefully it encourages more conversation and more personal responsibility around gun safety, which seems like an awfully horrible remote place for us to have to land when we're talking about school shootings that happen with enormous regularity. But if there can at least be some outer limits on what parents or other people who have firearms in their home, what they can do and still not be accountable for violent acts committed with those guns. It would be nice for future parents in the Crumbly situation to appreciate that they have an obligation to disclose their child's access to a firearm. Um, You know, nobody wants to think about talking about people that they love using guns to commit crimes. But if we are going to be a society where people freely and frequently are able to own guns, then there has to be some way to require people to engage in better safety, better training, and greater restrictions on access to those firearms. Especially, as you pointed out, when the child was actively fantasizing about killing and when the parents were called to school to take him out of school and get him counseling that day the very day of the killing, and they refused to take him home. They said no. And the testimony in the preliminary hearing, to me, is very riveting, and we can actually post a link to some of the testimony or at least articles about the testimony. Um, The mother, when she found out, was not so concerned about him, but she, some of her first actions were to say, please don't fire me because of what my son did to her boss, and calling uh, a person who was housing her horse uh, and say, I have to sell him fast. Obviously, they were trying to get money together to escape. And that brings up the question, Barb, that the parents have hired a very high-priced private attorney, both of them, each has their own attorney. And one of them, by the way, represented Larry Nasser, who was the Olympic gymnastics sexual assaulter. Um, And... 
Ethan has a public defender. So to me, that says a lot about the parents' values, uh, especially coupled with this evidence. But um, I, I, I wonder what you think about you know, that. Do you agree with me that it's really very um, damaging to the parents that they have done this and they're letting their son be represented by a public defender? Yeah, I, you know, I, I doubt this will come out at trial, so I don't think it'll be damaging to them in any sort of legal consequence. Um, but it, it does, you know, kind of suggest that they're keeping all the money for themselves and using it to hire a high-priced attorney and throwing their son under the bus and letting him, you know, uh, fend for himself with a public defender. But I guess one thing I, I want to point out is that uh, public defenders are actually quite good lawyers. And just because you spend a lot of money on a lawyer doesn't mean you're getting better representation. In fact, uh, the lawyers who do public defense in Oakland County are, are quite good. And I think his lawyer in particular is reputed to be quite good. The challenge with most public defenders is that they're spread too thin. Many of our best law students go on to become public defenders, but they um, you know, often are overburdened with so many cases, they just can't devote the same kind of attention to a case that a privately retained lawyer can, when you're paying them $1,000 an hour, you'd be surprised at how much work they'll do for you. Uh, instead, if you're paid you know, per case, uh, or you've got a docket with you know, hundreds and hundreds of cases in it, you don't have time. But I, I would suspect that in a case like this, that the public defender will be uh, able to focus on this case and will have her, her docket substantially reduced so that she can spend sufficient time working on this case. And I suppose um, if you had enough money to pay for one lawyer and not two lawyers, the, the crumbly parents are not going to qualify for public defenders because they have horses and jobs and all of these assets, whereas their 15-year-old son, without parental support, has nothing. And so on his own, he qualifies. So I suppose if you're making a decision that's best for your family, maybe this counts. But just from a parent's perspective. So that, that's my sort of objective view. But I also think that if if I were in a similar situation, which is hard to imagine, and it's hard to imagine what any of us would do when we find ourselves in a really awful situation, I'd like to think that I would give everything I have to benefit my child. Uh, even if he did something horrible like this and should, should – uh, pay the price for it and pay the consequences for it. I would want there to be some exploration of his mental health and um, to ensure that, uh, you know, he was being, his rights were being upheld, his, uh, he was getting a fair trial and he was getting treatment that he needs either while awaiting trial or afterwards um, in hopes of rehabilitation. Um, so it's hard to, to pass judgment on other parents. Um, and I don't know that it is, we should assume that he's getting a bad lawyer just because they're a public defender. I definitely don't assume that because every public defender I've known is dedicated, hardworking, and really good. Um, and one of your best students, who is my cousin, has moved to Colorado to be a public defender. That's what he wanted to do, and he was a brilliant student. So, yes, um, and my other cousin, who is also his, who's his aunt, um, was a public defender here in Chicago. So it runs in the family, and we applaud public defenders. And I would have to point out that Nasser's lawyer didn't do so well for him. So yeah, uh, right. high-priced lawyers <laughs> definitely don't, don't mean much. And I, I, I also, what you said makes me say, the parents cleaned out Ethan Crumbly's bank account. They left him 99 cents and took out $6,000. That money could have been used for mental health purposes. And we certainly have evidence that he needs that. So yeah. Um, anyway, Joyce, last question. What's next for Ethan and his parents? Well, the parents will be back in court for a final ruling on whether the state has probable cause to proceed in the next few weeks. But I think it's pretty clear that the state does and that this case will move forward. So for Ethan and his parents, each of them individually, they'll have to make a decision about whether they want to try to enter into a plea agreement with the state or whether they want to proceed to trial. Um, different calculus for, for each of them. Uh, but I think we'll see those decisions being next up in this case. And it might be worth mentioning, just, and, and Barb, maybe, or, or Joyce, one of you can fill in, uh, just for our audience purposes, that a preliminary hearing is not mandatory in all cases, but 
it has some advantages and disadvantages um, from my standpoint, both as a prosecutor and as a defense lawyer. But why don't one of you fill that in? I can chime in briefly because we were just talking about this in our criminal procedure class. You know, a grand jury is guaranteed in all federal cases by the Constitution, but it's one of the rights that has not been incorporated uh, to the states through the 14th Amendment, the way many other provisions in the Bill of Rights is. So states are free to dispense with a grand jury and instead proceed by way of preliminary examination or preliminary hearing. The, 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 the task, whether it's a grand jury or a judge, is to find whether there's probable cause to believe that there is sufficient evidence for a case to go forward. And that's just a protection uh, for citizens against the state to make sure that cases are being brought for a proper purpose, not, you know, based on, you know, uh, political motivation or it's completely made up and fabricated, that there's evidence. You know, this is not guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. This is not a full trial. But, uh, you know, just is is there sufficient evidence on each of the elements here uh, such that we think this case should pass on uh, and move to the trial stage? So that's what the judges are deciding there. There's some real pros and cons of each. You know, I think that, again, the, the Grand jury is a right enshrined in the Constitution for protection, but it's very secret. Uh, And there's a good reason it's secret. It helps for investigations that it be secret, but it also means that there's no opportunity for cross-examination by the defense. There is no neutral judge presiding. The prosecutor is the legal advisor to the grand jury. Um, And although things are transcribed, those transcripts are only turned over in rare circumstances. So there is room for abuse and mischief if a prosecutor were not ethically uh, inclined. Um, The preliminary exam phase uh, does not have that grand jury protection, but they have a judge making this decision. So you don't have the same sense of 12 citizens making this decision. You have one judge, and a judge is part of the state. And so perhaps it doesn't have that same uh, symbolic value of citizens passing on this question and saying, yes, this case should go to trial. But it's in the open, and so everybody gets to see the evidence. Um, And it's a preview for the defense. They get a little bit of the evidence. They can cross-examine witnesses. They can do some damage to a case. They can expose harms to a case and maybe position it better for plea negotiations. They can lock witnesses into a story that makes it harder for them to change their testimony at trial. So strategically, there are a lot of advantages to doing the preliminary exam versus grand jury for that probable cause finding. You know, Joyce, as I'm spending more time at home, I look around at my shabby furniture and I think how great it would be to redecorate in California chic. Have you thought about that? You know, I think about it all the time. I'm a native California girl, and I love that cool, simple uh, style that sort of has some notes of mid-century modern, but also of a very clean modern style. And I'm in the middle of redoing a couple of bedrooms and a bathroom because speaking of shabby, after two and a half years of pandemic with kids living and working from home and many dogs and cats and chickens, uh, our house is in need of a real redo. And so I have turned to Jenny Kane, who advertises with our podcast for help and for inspiration. I'm absolutely in love with everything in their catalog. It's easy. It's stylish. It's essentials in California style. And I just love everything about it. What about you, Jill? I agree. I, it's a fun website to look at. I haven't seen a catalog. You I haven't see been flipping online. through your J. Crew catalog, and everything. Jill? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been I reading get the law catalogs. Books. Does that mean I've been <laughs> buying a lot from them? Because they mail me catalogs. Yeah, it must mean that. But <laughs> it makes great gifts in addition to spiffing up your own house. They are wonderful gifts. They have wonderful blankets and pillows in addition to gorgeous furniture. So it's really been a pleasure to look at it and to have some of it at home. Plus their clothes are pretty terrific too. Yeah, everything about this brand is great. I'm in love with the Harbor Sofa and it's sectional in ivory linen. You know, for me, when I'm decorating, the sofa is one of the most important pieces in a space. And the Harbor Sofa and sectional just sort of scream, hey, you're at home, come and relax. Um, The pieces in the collection, they're comfortable, they're inviting, they're minimalist, and the palette is just perfect. The pieces come in natural linen, an ivory linen, and also in a really beautiful charcoal linen. So three perfect neutrals. And they also come, these sofas and sectionals, in different sizes. So no matter how big the space that you're designing is, you can find just the size that will fit. Jenny Kane Holmes California-inspired classics are perfect for any room or mood. And if you can't get enough of Jenny Kane, now you can join Jenny Kane Rewards. 
Enjoy exclusive perks and benefits like birthday surprises and early access to new launches. Plus, you can earn up to 10% back on all purchases. Join today and you'll get 100 points. You can create the space you'll never want to leave at JennyKane.com and get 15% off your first order when you use code SISTERS at checkout. That's 15% off your first order at Jenny Kane, J-E-N-N-I-K-A-Y-N-E dot com when you use the promo code SISTERS. And you can look for the link in our show notes. And if you use that code, it helps us out. So please do so. This week, like past weeks, the January 6th committee has continued to be hard at work. This week, the big stories involved revelations about handling of Trump's presidential papers. First, we heard that he'd torn up a lot of documents that had to be taped back together before they could be sent to the National Archives to comply with the Presidential Records Act. Then we learned about 15 boxes of presidential papers recovered from Mar-a-Lago. And next came news that some of those documents were classified. And then I think the final straw was learning that White House plumbers had to be repeatedly called in to handle toilet clogs during the Trump presidency, which appeared to be the result of large amounts of paper being flushed. I know that notion of White House plumbers will resonate with Jill. Um, So where to start? Barb, why don't we just cut to the chase? Um, I, I know we're talking about the committee's work here, but there are also reports that the archivist referred some of these issues to the Justice Department. Is there criminal conduct going on, as some people have speculated, and what should DOJ be doing? Yeah, this is such interesting news, isn't it? And I also imagine, you know, the person who's got this job at the White House, like, Mom and Dad, guess what? I've got a job at the White House, and and, and I work in the Oval Office. They say, oh, that's great. What do you do? Um, I pick up little scraps of paper that the president has torn up, and I meticulously tape them back together. That's, that's, we're proud of you, son. That's great. Um, (laughs) But uh, this is very interesting from two perspectives. So the mishandling of classified information and the reporting is that some of these documents were designated top secret is important, not only from a criminal perspective, but from a counterintelligence perspective. So top secret, that means when documents are stamped top secret, that means the disclosure of those documents would cause exceptionally grave damage to the national security of the United States. So I don't know what's in it, but it's often sources of, in, of information, you know, people who are working as spies in foreign countries or methods of collection. You know, there are all kinds of electronic techniques that are not publicly known. It could even be substantive things like the location of troops, um, it, or capabilities, military capabilities, weapons capabilities. So I don't know what is in those documents, but the mere fact that they have been spilled, and that is sometimes the word that's used when it's an unintentional uh, disclosure, when, there, when, when information that is that sensitive has been spilled, there must be a counterintelligence investigation to determine the, the damage, to assess the damage. Whose hands did this get into? Has this gotten into the hands of the public, of foreign adversaries, of people who could use it against us? Has it in any way compromised the identity of those sources, people who are acting in other countries? Are their lives at stake? Do we need to get them out of there? Um, methods. Are, is this method going to go dark because now people know about it and they're going to start communicating on different channels? Do we need to take proactive steps to mitigate that damage? And so they need to investigate immediately from a counterintelligence perspective to find out what that harm is and take any necessary steps to try to fix that problem. Then from a criminal perspective, there are a number of different statutes that make it a crime to mishandle classified information. Everything from selling secrets to foreign governments to um, just mishandling classified information can be a crime, but usually there is a requirement of some intent. And this was, we, we learned a lot about this when Hillary Clinton was, um, you know, investigated for her emails. There were, um, I think, more than 100 of them that ended up on her private server that had classified information on them. And the question was, why were they there? And so similarly, um, the fact that these boxes ended up at Mar-a-Lago, I think some questions need to be asked. Who brought them there? Why were they brought there? Did anybody um, bring them for an improper purpose? Did they know that there was uh, that these were top secret? Uh, you know, the president is an unusual is in an unusual situation in that he can declare something uh, declassified um, at a moment's notice. So. 
uh, it's possible that he took these things for his presidential library and he intended to declassify them, but he, he has to safeguard them until that is done. And so I think there's a lot of room for investigation here, both from a counterintelligence perspective as well as a criminal perspective. So I hear investigation. Do you think that this will end up as a prosecution, Barb? I think it's, uh, I, I guess you have to say, see where it goes. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to prejudge it and say, oh, absolutely. I think you need to know who did what and why. You know, my, my first instinct is there's no way Donald Trump has ever pecked a box in his life. Um, but I also <laughs> have read that he, he, he did and he prevented other people from seeing what was in there. So I guess I'd want to know more before I, I uh, draw a conclusion on that, Joyce. Yeah, there was interesting reporting last night that he was very territorial about the boxes and didn't want aides to look at them. I sort of tend to think that just the raw records violation would be less attractive for prosecution than if there was evidence of some sort of intent yep. to obstruct or maybe a conspiracy to interfere with government. What about you, Jill? Do you think this is headed towards a criminal case? Well, let me talk more generally about this because, number one, he can't declassify them after January 20th at noon. Right, that's right. So unless he did it before that, these are top secret and state top secret. But I think that the crime and the wrong and the mishandling applies to all of the things that he took, even the map of Florida that he redrew to show that the hurricane was really going to hit other places. The than Alabama the, hurricane, right? It was exactly, Sharpie hurricane. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. So I think that's bad. I think taking the love note from North Korean dictator is equally mm -hmm. bad. Um, the Presidential Records Act is to protect not just the future history of our country that will be written by historians 10 years, 100 years from now, but it's also so that we can look at things for accountability right now. And so taking any of these things away, it's also to let the new administration be able to do the job that it needs to do based on what has already happened. And if you purloin those documents and hide them and secrete them out of the White House, then the new administration doesn't have the benefit of knowing that. So I'm less concerned about, well, not less concerned. I share your concern that counterintelligence measures need to be taken because they were taken out, whether deliberately or not, you still have to do that. But I'm as concerned about all the other documents. And there are many cases of government officials being convicted for having taken those documents, also stealing the documents from the archives. And although he didn't steal them from the archives, he prevented them from ever going there. They are, at the moment of their creation, government property. And so if you don't turn them over to the government and you take them away with you, you're stealing government property. So I, I think that there are plenty of crimes that could apply um, to his handling, whether they were classified or just regular. Um, he was only the temporary custodian of the property, and whether he tore it up flushed it down, and of course I am completely in love with the idea that we had the plumbers who were trying to plug leaks, and now we need plumber, plumbers to unclog the toilets is quite hysterical, and I also love that there's a gap because, of course, Watergate <laughs> yeah, had the his, 18 and a half minute history gap. History doesn't repeat, yeah. but it rhymes. Well, this time it's kind of repeating, I think. So, um, well, you know, I think we... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say that's exactly where I was going to head next, this notion of, of gaps and history rhyming. Barb, there's been reporting that the White House call logs for January 6th are incomplete. Um, is this as devious and as, as uh, potent of a gap as Richard Nixon's? Um, should, what should we be reading? Yeah, I can't reporting? wait to hear Jill's thoughts on this, you know, because she, she prosecuted or questioned um, Rosemary Woods, right? The, the famous uh, missing minutes of the tape. Was it 18 minutes, Jill? If it, missing 18, 18 and, a half. and a half minutes from, from the tape. <laughs> but um, I do think it's concerning. There are calls that we know about that are not recorded in the logs for January 6th. Uh, the fact that we know about some makes you wonder, are there others that we don't know about? And I think questions need to be asked about why not? You know, I suppose any system of records from time to time has an omission that may be unintentional, but you know, in light of all that was going on on January 6th, 
w- w- there's a, a strong interest in finding out President Trump's involvement. Was he asked to uh, call up the National Guard to stop what was happening? You know, I mean, deaths were occurring there. Mike Pence's life was in danger. And so were that a lot of Trump supporters who were there that day. Uh, you know, what was going on in the in the flow of all those calls? Really important factual documentation. And if someone did either fail to write them down as they were required to do or uh, remove them uh, from the log, uh, you know, it is something that we often refer to as consciousness of guilt. The act alone may be a crime to delete uh, records as obstruction of justice if there's an investigation, but it also can tend to show that you know that this is this is going to look really bad if anybody sees this later, or it might cause people to ask questions about, who did you talk to? I'm going to go ask them what you said. Um, and so anytime someone removes evidence, uh, it is also, I think, some indication of guilt, or it can be considered in that light. Um, and so for that reason, I, I think it's it's all the more interesting to know whether and why someone removed these 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 records than if they had simply been there. Um, you know, the cover-up is always worse than the crime. I was always grateful to defendants <laughs> who would destroy evidence or lie, because now they just made the case easy. It might have been hard for me to put together this whole huge conspiracy, but now I can prove you in a lie? Pfft, piece of cake. You know, and this pops something else into focus, right? This notion that Trump used his personal cell phone to make calls, which I guess could possibly be how these calls were made. Barb, I know you and I did the same thing when we were U.S. attorneys because we were out at dinner one night and I remember laughing because we had four cell phones between the two of us, right? You carried your personal phone and your government phone because your government calls had to make um, the records list. And this also really brings into focus for me something that I thought was odd at the time when the January 6th committee started subpoenaing phone records for Trump children and people around him. And I thought, well, why would they object to that? The committee is so obviously entitled to those records. Well, now we know, right? There's there's certainly some sensitivity around um, calls that were made to or from these phones. But Jill, you pointed out that this gap compares to the gap in Watergate. What are your thoughts on this? Well, well, first of all, let me point out why it's important. These call logs that are missing are important for a couple of reasons. One is they can lead to evidence. They can show what was happening in real time in a way that nothing else can. The White House records were very important in discovering witnesses that we needed to interview during Watergate. So I want people to understand that they're really important. Um, And I will also point out that the gap changed public perception of Nixon and the crimes. It was a real fast turnaround when they heard about the 18-minute gap. All of a sudden, they saw the president differently, and they saw him as corrupt and as uh, obstructing justice. So that's important. But also the hypocrisy of this. I mean, we've mentioned Hillary today already, but the lock her up and the get her 300,000 emails and what about and what about Well, the hypocrisy of Donald Trump, who we now know used a personal cell phone and oftentimes to even make it harder to track him, would ask someone standing in the room, give me your phone, I want to use it to make a call. So we can't say that there's actually a gap in this log. There may not be a gap. There's no coverage because he didn't use the appropriate phone. The way the two of you carried your government phone at all times to take your government calls, he evaded record keeping by using personal phones of himself and other people. So the hypocrisy bothers me a lot. And, you know, when they were yelling, lock him up, lock her up, I think it's time to be yelling, lock him up. Well, one last twist and turn for the committee this week. They've issued another subpoena. This time, Jill, it's gone to former Trump trade representative, COVID misinformation peddler, and the Green Bay sweep proponent, Peter Navarro. Uh, What does the committee want out of Navarro, and why is it important? Well, first of all, it's all part of the overarching conspiracy to overturn the election, to create a coup. And that's what it shows. And he, um, 
Navarro is not acting alone. I mean, you can link him to Eastman and Clark and Waldron and Jenna Ellis and Rudy Giuliani. Green Bay Sweep was part of an effort to overturn the election, and it includes the January 6th, but so, so much more. And what they want from him is the evidence of the conspiracy to overturn our election, the conspiracy to create a coup, and it was all part of this plan to get it to be uh, heard by state legislatures, to create chaos, to give them time, but all of it is part of one thing, and that is taking your vote away from you, not letting the votes be counted that were cast. There's no fraud. It's all part of this big lie about fraud, and he's not going to get away with it. I think that he, um, along with everybody else who's been subpoenaed, is going to have to face the consequences. Well, let's talk about consequences. I mean, Barb, what happens if Navarro just ignores the subpoena? Others have done that and uh, been subjected to prosecution, but we've got this uh, referral for Mark Meadows that the committee has made over to DOJ. It's been sitting there for uh, almost a couple of months now without doing anything. Does Navarro just think he gets a free pass? This is becoming far more complicated. So Mark Meadows, at the time he refused to testify, was asserting executive privilege, saying, you know, this is the president's privilege to waive, not mine, and until he does, I, I won't. And now the Supreme Court has held in the National Archives case that the privilege must yield in a case of this significance. And so I think that really eliminates uh, any basis to use executive privilege to refuse to testify here. But I think it's going to be a, a, a challenging problem because, you know, Steve Bannon was an easy call. The The government charged him with um, contempt and they'll deal with him with contempt in an effort, I think, to probably deter other people from uh, thumbing their nose at these subpoenas. But for some of these other people like Meadows and, and, and now Navarro, I think there's a really good chance they could be under investigation themselves for substantive crimes like conspiracy to defraud the United States. I mean, Navarro, all those things that Jill just said, that plot is really starting to come into focus now about what the plot was. Uh, and Navarro says they had 100 congressmen on board. You know, what they were going to do is from the six swing states, they were going to say, well, you, we have competing electors. We have fraud in those states. We have a lot. They were going to stage hours of debate on each of those. There's so much chaos. We're just going to throw it to the House to let them decide. And the House had Republican majority, uh, which would have uh, voted for, for Donald Trump to be the president. Or if they got too much pushback there, the alternative plan was to then say, well, let's send it back to those states and their legislatures can decide, knowing full well that those legislatures are Republican controlled as well. And so this was a real plot. And I think, um, I, I'm not sure they want to uh, charge him just with contempt. And if they do charge him with contempt, does that do anything to adversely affect their ability to charge them later with this more substantive charge? I don't know. I mean, maybe they could. I, I think they don't want to get to go down the road of, of immunity because that can really cause some problems if you get immunized testimony and then you know some remnant of that uh, is, is used uh, against them in a criminal case. It could blow up the way it did with Oliver North in the Iran-Contra scandal. So I think they have to tread very carefully here. And it, it could explain why we have not seen charges to date about Meadows. It's because they're thinking of, of him not as a witness, but as a defendant. I think that's a really good answer. And that I know during Watergate, it happened um, where we were in touch with the Senate about giving use immunity versus transactional. But even with use immunity, you then have a really heavy burden as the prosecutor to prove that nothing that you're using was fruit of the poison tree, so to speak, that it didn't somehow, you didn't get alerted to it. And um, that's an important thing to keep in mind. So I think you have a very good point there, Barb. It's really fascinating. We've all been talking about whether there's any proof of life of an investigation at DOJ, and perhaps this delay on prosecuting Meadows isn't something bad, isn't a sign of delay, but rather it's a sign of uh, quiet activity going be going on behind the curtain at DOJ. We'll just have to uh, wait and see what next I know you're having daily crises about holds. this, Joyce, but I have faith in our Justice Department. I think I, I just can't mm -hmm. imagine a world where they're not investigating. 
It really is <laughs> hard to imagine that they're not on this, given all of the evidence. And that's what I think makes it more troubling that we're not hearing right. about witnesses who are ducking grand right. jury subpoenas. Yeah, so lots of balls uh, up in the air. We've all defended them for uh, we've defended them for a long <laughs> time. And I think we are at a point. I know I'll speak for myself. I am at a point where I cannot imagine that if they were really doing something serious, that someone hasn't brought a suit to say, ah, you can't bring me in, or hasn't complained to the press, or hasn't gone on Fox News or Bannon's show, I, I'm, I'm really starting to lose hope that they are actually doing something. And yet, I agree with you, Barb, I cannot imagine a world in which they are not. The evidence is just too blatantly clear for them to not be taking action. They must do something. We've, we all know right in our hearts that if any of the three of us were the U.S. attorney in the District of Columbia, we would be running hard on this case. We would be assigning our best people to it. I would never prejudge whether I would prosecute until I could see all of the evidence, but I would be investigating, and I hope that they are. I am totally in love with HelloFresh. I have been making the best meals for many weeks now. The recipes have been phenomenal. And I'm trying tonight one of the ones that you've recommended, which is the barramundi. And tomorrow is the chicken with biscuits that you also recommended, guys. So I know you guys love it. What about yeah, you, Bob? Um, you know, I also have been enjoying HelloFresh because... You can make delicious meals that are healthy with, I can attest, zero culinary skills. Um, the thing I made most recently that, <laughs> that I really enjoyed was this like ginger curry chicken and vegetable dish. It was fantastic. It was like a you know, Thai-inspired mm. kind of uh, dish, and it was fantastic. With HelloFresh, you can get farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. How about you, Joyce? You've been using HelloFresh? You know, we do. When it's Bob's night to cook, we have HelloFresh in my house because HelloFresh has fit and wholesome recipes for satisfying and nutritious meals that you can feel good about with six recipes per week to choose from. And that includes low-carb and calorie-conscious options. You can customize your favorite dishes with new custom offerings by swapping out one protein or side for another, upgrading for a more luxe experience, or even adding protein to a veggie meal. That means more choices, more variety, and it means meals that are truly tailored just to you and your family. And also, sisters-in-law, we love that you can easily customize your order on the app within minutes, a lot less time than you would spend in the grocery store. You'll get fresh, high-quality ingredients that go from the farm to your kitchen in less than a week, all delivered right did to your door. Did you just say you can swap out one protein for another? Because I did not know that. Is that not cool? That's new. Yeah. It is because, you know, I favor the um, fish dishes, but I like variety as well. So maybe swapping out. Uh, for, I am going to explore that. That's great. Well, I'm not going to wait to get started, and you shouldn't either. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Sisters16 and use code Sisters16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com slash Sisters16 and use code Sisters16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts or get the link to America's number one meal kit in our show notes. And I'll tell you something I did this week. I ordered two that were sort of Mexican-inspired because I was having company. And that way I had enough food for four people. And it's just spread yeah. out beautifully and made oh, a great nice. company meal. And everybody that's thought cool. I was like Very so clever. professional. <laughs> The federal civil rights trial against the killers of Ahmad Arbery began this week with jury selection. The jury selection will continue into next week. And yes, I can say killers, even though they are presumed innocent in their federal case, because these are the same defendants who are already convicted of murder in state court, Travis and Gregory McMichael and Roddy Bryan. They were sentenced to life in prison in the state. And so Looking at their federal trial that you know is now beginning, let me start with you, Joyce, and ask why would the Department of Justice persist with federal charges after these very same defendants have already been convicted by the state for the same conduct and have been sentenced to life? 
Is this a violation? I, I, I sometimes hear this question of double jeopardy. You know, how does that work? Uh, how is it that, that they can charge him with this crime after they've already been convicted? Well, let's start with double jeopardy. I, I hear that same question a lot, too. And there's not a double jeopardy problem here, but let me give a quick explainer. Double jeopardy is a legal doctrine that says a defendant can't be tried for the same crime more than once by the same sovereign. So we have to understand what same sovereign means, and it's pretty common sense. That means that if a defendant is acquitted at trial by the state, the state can't prosecute him for the same crime a second time. The state only gets one bite at the apple. If you're charged in New York, but somehow Michigan also has jurisdiction, then Michigan can probably do a second prosecution because it's a different sovereign. And so prosecutors, we say that jeopardy attaches once the jury is impaneled, once the jury is sworn in. And that's the point in time at which the government, whether it's federal or one of the states, has gotten its one bite at the apple, and they have to live with the results of that trial. Um, and there's a little permutation of this in the federal system called the petite policy, which says even though it's technically not a double jeopardy violation, the federal government usually will not prosecute a defendant after they've already been prosecuted in a state case. But there's an exception. There's an exception for cases where the federal rights aren't fully vindicated in the state case. That's what's going on here in the Arbery prosecution, because the Arbery state prosecution was for the state murder crime, and federal prosecutors believed that it was very important to have a trial that got at the racial motivation that they believe exists for this crime, to hold those defendants accountable for the racially motivated crime, which creates deterrence. Uh, you know, it, it certainly exposes that sort of motivation and lets people know that they'll be punished very seriously for acting on it. But it also creates an environment for communities to engage in restorative justice and to work towards... Um, you know, it's complicated, it's not easy, it's not automatic, but to find some way to move forward and to fix uh, parts of the process that have been broken. Yeah. Now, um, Jill, I wonder why we're even having a trial at all. Just a week ago, I know Travis and Gregory McMichael, the father and son defendants in the case, wanted to plead guilty, but the judge rejected it. Why did she do that? And do you think she made the right call? I mean, they could have had a, a conviction and been done with it. Well, it's not a clear-cut answer to that, I would say. Um, the judge in that case, Judge Wood, rejected it because she felt that the terms of the plea deal were too restrictive and she wanted to be able to exercise her own discretion. Under the plea, uh, the two defendants would have been serving their time on the uh, hate crime in a federal prison, which is considered nicer, I mean, to the extent that being locked up and having your freedom taken away is in any way, shape, or form nice, but it, it's better conditions than in the Georgia state prison system. And so this would have let them serve the first 30 years of their life sentence, and the father is actually 66 years old, so 30 years is you know, pretty much close to a life sentence. So it would have let him serve it in better conditions. Um, the family objected to that, although um, Assistant Attorney General uh, Kristen Clark said that before they accepted this plea or proposed the plea, they had the family's uh, approval. Um, the family now says that isn't true. They didn't know about the terms of it, including this 30-year prison. The advantages of it were they would have waived their appeal of any uh, of their murder convictions. They would have been making a public confession that they had been motivated by race. And that's what the federal government really is trying to vindicate. Us. And, and the family wanted this, too. They want to show that this was a race-based crime, that he was killed because he was running while black, which is what the defendant who called the police said to them, why are you calling? Well, there's a black man running in the neighborhood. And so there was some, you know, 
positive things that would have come out of this plea in the, that admission of the race motivation. And it would have also saved the family from having to relive the trauma of this horrible day. And I think that can't be underestimated how terrible that would be. Um, the risk of not accepting it is that a jury could give a not guilty verdict, and nothing is accomplished by that when yeah, you had a right. guilty plea. So that's, that's a risk, um, and that's because obviously they're guilty of murder, but it's proving that their intent was racially motivated. So I, I think that's the judge rejected it because she wanted to be able to decide how long they would serve and where they would serve it. And um, so it's going to go to trial. Yeah. You know, as a prosecutor, I see that and I say this judge needs to get over herself. It's, <laughs> they had a, a very good uh, deal worked out that would have guaranteed 30 years in prison and an admission of guilt. I don't think it's appropriate to worry about where they're going to spend their time. You know, losing your liberty for 30 years or life is a punishment and just making it, you know, the punishment more severe because it's more uncomfortable, I don't think is an appropriate consideration. Right. And it wouldn't have shortened their yeah. sentence. They were sentenced to life. And after they finished right. their federal term. That's right. They would have had to be transferred to Georgia right. prison anyway. Right. So, yeah, I, I agree with your analysis. I just think the judge is, uh, I don't know, you know, sometimes the case becomes about them. Um, well, let me move on to Joyce. And Joyce, let me ask you a different question. Um, do you think we're going to see different evidence in this case, or is it just going to be a replay of the same evidence we saw in the first trial? Yeah, that's. I think that's the right question to ask about this case. First, I'm going to take up for Judge Wood just a bit and say I think she rejected this plea that tied her hands, and she was very clear when she spoke to the defendants and said that she could sentence them to less time, the same amount of time or more time. It will be very interesting to see if they're convicted where she lands. She may have thought that 30 years simply was not sufficient um, for this sort of a crime. This is southern Georgia where people take murder real seriously. And uh, Judge Wood, who's a highly regarded uh, jurist, might have just decided the government was giving it away a little bit too easily. So, so we'll see. But here's, here's what's different in this trial than in the state trial. A key element of the marquee charge in this case, which is 18 U.S.C. 245, criminalizing interference with rights. It's a primary civil rights statute. It's a hate crime statute. And the government has to prove motive. And we've talked about this before on the podcast. You don't usually have to prove the motive. And so in Georgia, in the state murder case, they didn't have to prove why the McMichaels and Roddy Bryant killed Ahmaud Arbery, they had to prove the fact and causation for the death and the intent to kill. Now the government will take on the burden of, of proving the motive. Um, and that's tough. That can be very, very difficult because you can't just prove that the McMichaels were racists, right? You can't just say these were bad guys who did bad things. Um, you've got to prove that in this particular instance that they were animated by racial motives uh, and show that specific actions that they took were the result of racial animus. So that will be what I'm looking for in this trial to see whether they can get that across to this jury. Yeah. And then, you know, to, to the extent there will be some duplication, you know, there'll be some witnesses who testify about the facts, about what they saw. Um, do you think, Chill, there is any tactical advantage to either the prosecution or the defense in having already had a preview of the evidence in the prior, tr prior trial? You know, are there pitfalls for witnesses who have to testify again? Well, you've kind of said it all, which is there are pitfalls because the testimony can be used as cross-examination if they deviate in any way from it. Uh, but it seems to me that the witnesses were pretty well uh, prepared in the first trial, and so there isn't going to be a big mistake. Yes, the defense now knows all the evidence except for the crucial missing element, which is the evidence of motive, that it was a racially motivated crime. And so they don't know exactly what's going to be coming. But with, you know, in federal, with the discovery rules, they know and they've, they've got anything that is exculpatory because that's required under federal rules. And so I, I don't think it's going to make a big difference, either advantage or disadvantage to either side that they know it. I just think it is going to be uh, some of the same evidence and it's going to be painful for the family to watch it again. 
All right, well, we'll leave it there and we'll watch the trial play out. Y'all know that I'm mattress shopping because I'm redoing bedrooms in our house, and I'm so glad that I know about Helix mattresses and especially about their special offer for hashtag sisters-in-law listeners. I know mattresses don't have <laughs> pockets, but are you a fan of Helix mattresses too, uh, I am, but you know, you can stuff uh, your valuables underneath the mattress, so it's pocket <laughs> adjacent. Close to pockets, yeah, right? I, I guess so. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, the Helix mattress is great because they recognize that one size does not fit all. And so they've got a lot of different varieties to help guarantee that you get the perfect night's sleep. How about you, Jill? Are you enjoying the Helix mattress experience? Yes. And it's because I took the Helix quiz and I matched up with Helix Midnight Mattress and it was exactly what I wanted, even though I didn't know that's what I wanted. But when it came, it was really comfortable. It was the mattress that was just right for me and my husband. Why buy one made for someone else if you can get one made for you? Just go to helixsleep.com sisters to take their two-minute sleep quiz to match with a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. From soft to firm, plus size and cooling, they have it all. Not to mention that it's got many doctor and chiropractor recommendations. Helix mattresses come with a 10-year warranty, and you can try it out for 100 nights risk-free. It gets delivered right to your door, and they'll pick it up if needed. So you never have to go to a mattress store again. And I know it sounds weird that it's delivered to your door, but it's it really easy Jill? because Does it fit it's in the rolled mailbox? up. It fits in a box. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think they have to knock on your door and let you know it's there. But it's now available to our listeners for up to $200 off any mattress and two free pillows if you go to our, um, when you buy it, and put in helixsleep.com slash sisters. That's helixsleep.com slash sisters for up to $200 off and two free pillows. And look for the link in our show notes. Thanks to Helix for sponsoring this episode. And we thank you, our listeners, for supporting Helix. Every week, we get to the part of the show where we get to answer your questions, and I'm taken with how hard y'all make us think. You know, your questions are thoughtful, they often go straight to the heart of matters, and we're very grateful to have listeners who keep us on our toes and make all of us smarter. If you've got a question you'd like to have us answer, please email us at sistersinlaw at politicon.com or tweet using the hashtag sistersinlaw. And if we don't get to your questions during the show, keep an eye on our Twitter feeds throughout the week because we'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can. Our first question comes from Ben. Ben asks, bail reform seems to be a big part of the rise in crime discussion. Why does bail exist? Why is it unfair to the poor? Do judges have absolute discretion about anyone deemed a risk to the community in terms of violence, etc.? In other words, Ben wants us to explain how release and specifically pretrial release works in this country. Barb, do you have thoughts about that? I, I do. And Ben's right. This has been a big uh, topic of discussion for advocates of criminal justice reform. And, and what they're focusing on is the cash bail system. That is a system where people get um, out if they can afford to pay. So in some jurisdictions, for example, there's just a, a bail schedule. And bail is set depending on the crime you're charged with. Okay, if you're charged with armed robbery, uh, bail, I look at my little chart here, it says it's $50,000 and you've got to pay 10% uh, up front. Therefore, uh, you need to pay $5,000 to get out. And if you can't pay it, then you're just, you're just not getting out. And so for some people, $5,000 is, you know, I, I, a lot of money, but I, I can afford it. And so I'm getting out. You know, for somebody who doesn't have any money or has very little money, $5,000 might as well be $5 million because I'm not getting out. So it has this disparate impact on people based on income. I think a better model is the one that is used in the federal system, which does not require any money up front. Um, people are detained only if the prosecution can show that they are either a danger to the community by clear and convincing evidence or a risk of flight. So you have someone like uh, Joe Garcarne of the Boston Marathon bomber. Based on his crimes, you can say he is a danger to the community. 
um, he should be detained pending trial, even though he has a presumption of innocence. Um, or he should be uh, detained pretrial because he has a risk of flight. He might run away and we won't be able to find him. And we know that because for a week we've been trying to catch him and, and track him down. But for other defendants, uh, there is under the federal statute a presumption of release that everyone else will be released unless they oppose some danger to individuals in the community, like the victims or the public at large, uh, or that they might run away and not come up, but come back. And so what they do instead um, is they make a promise to pay. If I do not appear, if I fail to appear, then I owe the government in my district, the, t- the typical bond is $10,000. I owe you a debt of $10,000 if I fail to show up. And if they fail to show up, they get caught and they owe $10,000 to the government, which is collected. So it works. We have very few uh, flights. When we do, we catch them and they owe that amount of money. Um, and it, it gives the judge the discretion to keep detaining the people he or she believes are pose a risk of danger or a risk of flight, but letting out the others without uh, requiring money up front, that cash bail that does have that disparate impact on indigent defendants. So thanks, Ben, for the great question. Yeah, and I want to add, Ben, that Illinois, my state, was the first state in the country to eliminate cash bail for defendants who are arrested for a crime here. So we have taken up the federal position of how to handle uh, bail, which is, by the way, based on a presumption of innocence. And you're innocent until proven guilty after a trial. So you shouldn't be um, held in prison prior to that. Our next question comes from Katie. Jill, I think this is a great one for you because of your experience working for the bar. She says, given all the malfeasance by many lawyers, Giuliani, Cohen, who was disbarred, Taylor Green, Eastman, even Cuomo, what does it take for an attorney to have their license withdrawn? So first of all, let me say the bar, you mean the American Bar Association. I never worked in a bar. but um, <laughs> And here, everybody had this vision of you serving beer. Come on. A spe- no, wine. I would have served <laughs> wine, right? Uh, anyway, um, yes. We have seen, since the time of Watergate, uh, the rules of ethics have been tightened up, I would say, because how many lawyers were involved in that scandal? And I think we're going to exceed the number of lawyers involved in Watergate with the number involved in Trumpgate. There are so many lawyers involved, and uh, Katie mentioned many of them, but there are, you know, beyond those, there are more, who had very active roles. And we already have um, cases that have been brought against Giuliani. I mean, he's close to being permanently disbarred in New York. Uh, Cohn has been disbarred. I would say Sidney Powell, who wasn't on that list, will be disbarred because they have used their powers as attorneys for the harm of society and to lie to courts, for example. Those are things that they cannot do. So what does it take? It takes a complaint and it takes evidence, just like any other case. And um, the evidence against Giuliani right now is pretty clear in terms of what he said in filing lawsuits and attaching fraudulent affidavits to suggest that there was any uh, fraud in the election when there was none. And so I think that they will end up being disbarred. And then some of them will end up being convicted of substantive crimes, and that also can lead to it. It doesn't require that a lawyer or a judge bring the charges to the attention of the state licensing authority. And this is not handled by the American Bar Association. It is handled by each state has their own licensing authority. And so a citizen can bring complaints. And I do believe that people have been writing to local bar associations saying, what about this conduct by, and you know, name some of the people who have been involved. Uh, who are lawyers. And as long as it has to do with either a crime that they get convicted of for anything that would reflect poorly on their practice of law, or that is an abuse of the court system by lying to the court or misleading the court, they can be disbarred. Thanks for listening to Hashtag Sisters in Law with Barb McQuaid, Jill Weinbanks, and me, Joyce Vance. Kim will be back with us next week. You can send in your questions by email to sistersinlaw at politicon.com or tweet them for next week's show using the hashtag sistersinlaw. 
Go to politicon.com slash merch to buy some of our fun merchandise, and please support this week's sponsors, Jenny Kane, HelloFresh, and Helix. You can find their links in our show notes. Please support them as they really help make this show happen. To keep up with us every week, follow the hashtag Sisters in Law podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, and please give us a five-star review because it really helps other people find our show. See you next week with another episode, hashtag Sisters in Law. Well, tell them that I make a killer salad dressing with their stuff. They're actually, I've been stooping to mixing it up in a measuring cup, not in the spoon. Really? And I'm usually too lazy to do that. You know, it's Nora Ephraim's recipe. Did you ever read? No. Oh, what is her book called? Um, Um, You know which one I mean. It's her first book. Yeah, I definitely read it. And she has recipes in it. And her salad dressing recipe is like, it's the best salad dressing. And it's super really? easy. Well, it's in the mixed event that I don't into the still vinegar. Have... Okay. Yeah. And, hey, and then you got to send it to me. Olive oil. I will. I'll, call, I'll take a picture and send it to you. I actually wanted to include recipes in the Watergate Girl. And there are some that are relevant. One is because when I had the dinner party to try to get people talking to Leon Jaworski when things weren't going so well, um, I had it catered because, one, I didn't have time not to, but I made the dessert, and it was from a law school classmate. It was a trifle, and it came out. It was really yummy and delicious, and there were a couple of other things that were relevant to the storyline, but my editor didn't want them in there, so my recipes didn't get included. I thought it made Nora's book unbelievably charming, and I literally make her recipes. You should have done well, it. Next book. Next book, I will, maybe with my pin book, I will include recipes, pins and recipes. I think you should do that. All right. Yeah. See y'all next week.